It is normal to get scared of the things we cannot control, and those we cannot share openly to anyone else because we don't want them to think that we are coward. This story is about a tooth who is so scared to undergo periodontal surgery. Dear Ate Shiro, Kindly hide my name as Tuti. I heard our owner will undergo surgery. I'm not quite sure what kind of surgery, but it involves me and my friends, Tutu and Tuta. I am scared of what will happen, but my friends are happy and excited about it. It is normal to get scared of surgery, right? I cannot share to my friends why I am scared because they always call me the bravest one. For a few days, I've been dreaming of undergoing surgery and leaving my friends. I couldn't take it anymore, so I told Tutu about it. Tutu, there is something I want to tell you. Tuti, what is it? I am scared of undergoing surgery. Why is it so? Don't you want to see the other parts of you? <gasps> what do you mean? Are they going to remove us? No, silly. We will undergo periodontal surgery, not tooth extraction. Ate Shiro, when Toto told me that we will not be removed, I was relieved, but still scared. So I asked him more about periodontal surgery. Tell me more, Tutu. Okay, Tuti, let me show you. Periodontal surgery includes treatment for surgical pocket therapy and correction of associated morphologic problems like mucogingival defects. Periodontal surgery is mainly for the improvement of the teeth and its replacement, aesthetics, controlling and eliminating non-existing or existing periodontal disease, and correcting anatomic conditions that satisfies accumulation of plaque and pocket recurrence. The essence of understanding periodontal surgery procedures is to have a certain goal in correcting defects that may predispose to periodontal disease by changing the gingival and mucosal tissues. There are three types of periodontal surgical techniques that are performed on non-inflamed tissues and in the absence of periodontal pockets. First one is the plastic surgery technique, a technique which uses grafts of various types to create or widen the attached gingiva. The second one is the aesthetic surgery technique, a technique which covers the nuded roots and recreates lost gingival papillae. The last one is the preprosthetic technique, a technique that adapts the periodontal and adjacent tissues to receive replacements. Now I get it. What kind of teeth need to undergo periodontal surgery? Just like us, Tuti, those who undergo altered passive eruption. Uh, altered passive what? It's altered passive eruption. Here, let me show you again. Altered passive eruption. Passive eruption is the continued apical movement of the free gingival margin epithelial attachment or junctional epithelium and connective tissue attachment that occurs after the tooth reaches functional occlusion. Goldman and Cohen termed this as the failure of the tissue to adequately recede to a level apical to the cervical convexity of the crown as altered passive eruption. Volkansky and Clayton Jones described the tissue's failure to reach the CEJ junction as delayed passive eruption. And in 1979, they confirmed the observations as the passive eruption of the teeth continues with increasing age. There are four stages of passive eruption. Stage 1 is where the sulcus and junctional epithelium are on the enamel. Stage 2 is where the sulcus is on the enamel and the junctional epithelium is part on the enamel and part on the cementum. Stage 3 is where the sulcus is at the cemento-enamel junction and the junctional epithelium is completely on the cementum. And stage 4, the sulcus and the junctional epithelium are apical to the cemento-enamel junction. 
This classification, which is still used today for the purposes of differential diagnosis and treatment of altered passive eruption. According to gingival anatomic ground relationships, type 1 is where the gingival margin is incisal or occlusal to the CEJ and the mucogingival junction is apical to the crest of bone, and there is a wider gingival dimension than generally accepted. Type 2 is where the gingival dimension is normal. The free gingival margin is incisal or occlusal to the CEJ. CEJ and the mucogingival junction is positioned at the CEJ. According to alveolar crest cemento enamel junction relationships, subgroup A is where the alveolar crest is located 1.5 to 2 mm from the cemento enamel junction. Subgroup B is where the alveolar crest is coincident with the cemento enamel junction. Ate Shiro, Toto enlightened me about periodontal surgery and he also reminded me not to be scared because we are in this periodontal surgery together. My letter is up to here only. I hope your viewers will learn from me too and my message for them is not to be scared of the things they won't do alone. Thank you, Ate Shiro. Sincerely, Tuti. you're back um before we start let's play the intro first It's Mikey here and welcome back to our show. Um, this is actually a special episode, a surprise one actually for the fans. And to thank you for your endless support for our educational video that was released three months ago, um, we posted on our Instagram account. Actually, this is also a celebratory for reaching half a million followers on our Instagram account as you can see from the screen. So, as a, for the surprise, we posted this photo asking the fans what do you want to learn? And these are the comments that we got. Okay, so we will base our topic for today based on the comments of the fans. Okay. What do you want to learn? Okay. From username Jeggy Jeggy, crown lengthening please, he said. And another one from forever cute underscore Nini, can you simplify crown lengthening? And another one from Ray Miguel underscore famous, hello, I suggest crown lengthening. Please po, crown lengthening. So, he's persistent. And, okay, this another one from Paulson underscore official. I miss your show. Oh, we miss you too. Please educate us about crown lengthening. Okay, as you can see, most of the comments are suggesting crown lengthening. So, we're gonna talk about crown lengthening for today. We're gonna simplify that topic. Okay, let's start with the definition. Generally speaking, crown lengthening are procedures under mucogingival surgery or now named as periodontal plastic surgery. It is a part of therapy that corrects excessive gingival display. In nature, it is a resective type of surgery that involves excision or apically positioning of the soft tissues. Um, according to the American Academy of Periodontology, 
Crown lengthening is a surgical procedure designed to increase the extent of the supragingival tooth structure for restorative or aesthetic purposes by apically positioning the gingival margin, removing supporting bone or bone. Okay, let's now talk about the indications and the contraindications of crown lengthening. So, for the indications, we can actually divide it generally into restorative needs of the patient and for the aesthetics. So, specifically speaking, for the restorative indications, first, to increase clinical crown height, loss due to tooth fracture, wear, and caries lesion. Second, to access gingival caries. Third, the need to correct the placement of margins of restorations without violating the biologic width. Fourth, the need to enhance retention of restorations. Fifth, to access a perforation in the coronal third of the root. For the aesthetic indications, first, the need to improve the aesthetics because of an even gingival margin. Second, excessive gingival display or gummy smile. Third, to facilitate the control of persistent inflammation around dips and gingival margins of restorations that have not responded to non-surgical periodontal therapy. For the contraindications, number one, teeth with short roots or reduced bone support. Number two, frication exposure in multi-rooted teeth. Number three, patients with high smile line. Number four, single anterior tooth. Number five, anterior teeth with long clinical crown. Number six, patients that smoke cigarettes. It is an absolute contraindication because it can impair wound healing. Number seven includes other factors, which includes patient compliance, oral hygiene, history of periodontal disease, and compromised medical conditions such as bleeding disorders. So let's talk about the classification of aesthetic crown lengthening. So this is the article that I've based this from. So there are actually four types. The type one, it is characterized by sufficient gingival tissue coronal to the alveolar crest, allowing the surgical alteration of the gingival margin levels without the need for the osseous recontouring. So typically, a gingivectomy or gingivoplasty procedure will usually suffice to establish the desired gingival margin position while simultaneously avoiding the violation of the biologic weight. So let's move on to the type 2. It is characterized by soft tissue dimensions that allow the surgical repositioning of the gingival margin without osseous recontouring, but nevertheless in violation of the biologic weight. This type basically consists of staging of crown lengthening procedure into two stages. So, for the stage 1, a gingivectomy procedure is done and required amount of crown is exposed. Once the tissues are healed, stage 2 procedure is done, in which a flap surgery is done and required amount of ostectomy is done to maintain the biologic width. Okay, for the type 3, bone sounding may reveal a scenario where repositioning of the gingival margin will result in the exposure of the osseous crest. So, it is inappropriate to refer these patients without providing them a surgical template derived from a relevant aesthetic blueprint. So, flaps should be able to reposition coronally rather than apically in order to maximize tissue preservation and allow the anticipated revisions to the gingival margins that will follow once the healing has been completed. So, following adequate healing, a gingivectomy may be performed to establish the definitive gingival position without the risk of violating the biologic weight. So, lastly, the type 4. Scenarios where the degree of gingival excision is compromised by an insufficient amount of attached gingiva. Ideal margin position, therefore, can only be achieved by an apically positioned mucoperiosteal flop with or without osseous recontouring. Okay, for the management of crown lengthening, this is actually the classification or the surgical techniques that you can do. So, it can be divided into surgical and combined. 
For the surgical management, we'll start with the instruments that we will use. So, periodontal knives for the incision and excision, periosteal elevators for the deflection and readaptation of mucosal flaps, soft tissue rondures, and tissue scissors. Of course, for the removal of adherent fibrous and granulomatous tissues. Scalers and curettes are also needed for scaling and root planing. Um, we will also need bone rondures, chisels, and files for the removal of bone tissue. We will need burrs for the root sectioning, sutures and needle holders, suture scissors for suturing, and plastic instruments for the application of the wound dress. Okay, for the surgical management for crown lengthening, let's start with surgical extrusion using the periotome. This technique avoids the consequences of extensive resective surgery and orthodontic extrusion like uneven gingival margins, loss of interdental papilla, or relapse, and several fibrotomy sessions. So for the procedure. The basic principle of this is to place the affected tooth structure in a more desired position which helps in reestablishment of the biologic width. So to discuss the procedure, we will base on this case report on what they did. So first, they anesthetized the area. Then, the blade of the periotome was placed into the periodontal ligament space and manipulated in walking motion to luxate a tooth without inducing surgical trauma. Then the teeth was extruded to the desired clinical position using a hemostat. Next is to place simple interrupted sutures for stability. After the procedure, analgesics and antibiotics were prescribed postoperatively. Temporary crowns may be used until there has been full healing and the gingival margin is in a stable position. Give periodontal pack and suture removal after 10 days is explained. Place the final restoration after 2 months. Okay, so let's move on with the external bevel gingivectomy. So this is done if anticipated that 2-3mm to three millimeters of keratinized gingiva will remain after the surgery. So the indications include sufficient sulcular depth and keratinized tissue, no violation of biologic width greater than 3 mm, no exposure of bone, presence of deep supraalveolar pockets. There are different techniques for the external bevel gingivectomy. So let's start first the conventional technique. So for the procedure, of course, anesthetize the area, then Step 2, periodontal knives are used for incisions on the facial and lingual surfaces. Urban periodontal knives are used for interdental incisions. Step 3 is to remove the excised pocket wall, then irrigate the area and examine the root surface. Step 4 is to scale and root plane. The last step would be cover the area with a surgical dressing or periodontal pack. Another technique of external bevel gingivectomy is the use of electrocotomy. So this is a case report entitled Clinical Evaluation for Treatment of Chronic Inflammatory Gingival Enlargement Using Diet Laser versus Electrocautery Gingivectomy. So in these pictures, the left side shows the preoperative photograph, symmetrical gingival hyperplasia in the lower anterior teeth. So the right picture shows the immediate gingivectomy using diode laser on the right side and electrocautery on the left side. Take note of that. And another set of pictures, the left side shows the one-week post-operative photographs. And the right picture shows the one-month post-operative photographs. So another technique is the use of laser. So this is another case report entitled The Aesthetic Con Correction of Gummy Smile by Gingivectomy Using Diode Laser. Okay, I think that would sum up all the basic information that you need to know about crown lengthening. I hope you learned a thing or two. And this is our thank you special episode for the fans around the world. And 
please follow our Instagram account for more updates and you can also suggest new content for us there. And you can also check Netflix for other lecturers about Crown Lengthening. And this is Mikey signing off. Thank you so much. of Crown Anthony, we already discussed about surgical managements, mainly surgical extrusion using peritone and external bevel gingivectomy. In this episode, we will be discussing about internal bevel gingivectomy, apical positioning of plaque, and combination of surgical and non-surgical techniques of Crown Anthony. So let's get down to it. So first is the internal bevel gingivectomy, with or without ostectomy. It is also referred to as flap surgery, with or without osseous surgery. It is a technique used when the bottom of the probable packet to be excised is located at or below the mucogingival junction. The incision is placed 0.5 to 2 mm away from the gingival margin and it is directed towards the alveolar crests. Its advantages are It preserves the existing gingiva. The marginal gingiva is exposed such that the morphology of the bony defects can be identified and the proper treatment be rendered. Forcation areas can be exposed and the degree of involvement and the tooth bone relationship can be identified. Slab can be repositioned at its original level or shifted apically, thereby making it possible to adjust the gingival margin to the local conditions. It preserves the oral epithelium and often makes the use of a surgical dressing superfluous. And also, post-operative period is usually less unpleasant to the patient when compared to gingivectomy. So from a didactic point of view, it seems more appropriate to consider surgical therapy with regard to how to deal with the soft tissue component and the hard tissue component of the periodontal packet at a specific tooth site. In soft tissue packets, the description of the various flap procedures reveals that, depending on the surgical technique used, the soft tissue flap should either be apically positioned at the level of the bone crest or maintained in a coronal position at the completion of the surgical intervention. In many patients, it may be of significance to position the flap coronally in the anterior tooth region in order to give the patient a prolonged time of adaptation to the inevitable soft tissue recession. However, in the posterior region, an apical position should be the standard. In a flap tissue without osseous surgery, here are the procedures. The initial or inverse bevel incision is made depending upon how much a crown exposure is required. Then, the second or the curvicular incision is made from the bottom of the sulcus to the bone to detach the connective tissue from the bone. The flap is then raised and the third incision is given to remove the tissue ducts. After a complete scaling and replaning, the flap is then sutured back in position. In hard tissue packets, there are a number of factors that should be considered in the treatment decision such as aesthetics, defect morphology, amount of remaining periodontium, tooth or tooth site involved. In aesthetics, since alveolar bone supports the soft tissue, an altered bone level through recontouring will result in recession of the soft tissue margin. In defect morphology, it is a variable significance for repair and regeneration during healing. Flap tissue with osseous surgery, here are the procedures. First, the initial or inverse bevel incision is made depending upon how much crown exposure is required. Then, the second or the curvicular incision is made from the bottom of the sulcus to the bone to detach the connective tissue from the bone. The mucoperiostal flap is designed and then raised. Then, the alveolar bone is reduced by ostectomy and osteoplasty using a combination of rotary instruments and chisels to expose the required tooth length in a scallop fashion to follow the desired contour of the overlying gingiva. The bone is then reduced close to the tooth, leaving the final removal of bone adjacent to the tooth to hand the instruments. The process is then completed with, with curettes directed against the bone. The final bone level should be measured carefully in all locations around the tooth 
to be certain that the minimal dimension of 3 to 5 millimeters of tooth height has been achieved throughout the entire circumference of the tooth. Following a flap surgery, a periodontal dressing may be placed to aid in maintaining flap adaptation. Gentle brushing and flossing may begin at 4 to 7 days post surgery or following dressing removal at 7 days post surgery. A chlorhexidine mouth rinse should be used for 4 to 6 weeks to aid in flap control. Restorative procedures should be delayed until 3 to 6 months post surgery. The longer period reduces the risk for gingival margin shrinkage in areas requiring maintenance of some gingival restoration margin. Also, Provisional restorations may be received at 3 to 4 weeks post surgery, but the margin should be placed supra gingivally. And now, I will show you a video of how an internal bevel gingivectomy is simply done. Before starting the incision, we do bone sounding. This is to find out the margins of the alveolar bone. So it is done by putting the periodontal probe horizontally and vertically, feeling the resistance from the bone. After we have visualized the bone margins, we can now start with the incisions. You can see here that the blade has been placed around 45 degree angle to the tooth surface, and the incision is put to 0.52 mm away from the gingival margin towards the alveolar crest. The thickness of the incision can be varied according to the thickness of the gingiva in that area, and this is how we put the incision. Now you can see in the video that malformed gingival margins have to be included so that a fine gingival margin can be achieved. Now you can see here that the incision line is very clear and you have a triangular wedge of tissue after you have put the incision. The same way incision is repeated on the parallel aspect. You can use contra angle with the handle because in the molar areas, it is difficult to put internal bevel incision with straight BB handle. And this is how we complete the incision. And now, our next topic is apical positioning of flap with or without bone reduction. It was introduced by neighbors in 1954 as a technique for the preservation of the gingiva following surgery. Following osseous surgery for elimination of bony defects and the establishment of physiologic contours and repositioning of the soft tissue flaps to the level of the alveolar bone, healing will occur primarily by first intention, especially in areas where proper soft tissue coverage of the alveolar bone has been obtained. As a general rule, at least 4 mm of sound tooth structure must be exposed at the time of surgery. During healing, the suprachrestal soft tissues will proliferate coronally to cover 2 to 3 mm of the root thereby leaving only 1-2 to mm of supragingivally located sound tooth structure. The apically positioned flap technique with bone re recontouring may be used to expose sound tooth structure and biologic width if less than 3 mm, while apically repositioned flap without osseous resection is done when there is a large biologic width of more than 3 mm on multiple teeth. It is indicated in sites where there is insufficient gingiva for reduction, so the initial incision is placed intracircularly and the mucoporiastral flap is raised and apically positioned to gain the needed crown length and when there is a crown lengthening of multiple teeth in a quadrant or sextant of the dentition. It is contraindicated when there is a surgical crown lengthening of single teeth in the aesthetic zone. The steps of apically repositioned flap is as follows. It is done initially by making an internal bevel incision to preserve as much of the keratinized and attached gingival as possible. It should be no more than about 1 mm from the crest of the gingival and directed to the crest of the bone. Then, cervicular incisions are made, followed by initial elevation of the flap. Then, inter interdental incisions are performed, and the wedge of tissue that contains the packet wall is removed. Vertical incisions are then made extending beyond the mucogingival junction. It is important that vertical incisions and thereafter the flap elevation reached past the mucogingival junction to provide adequate mobility to the flap for its apical displacement. If the objective is a full thickness flap, it's elevated by blunt dissection with a periostral elevator. If a split thickness flap is required, it is elevated using sharp dissection with a barred Parker knife to split it, leaving a layer of connective tissue including the periostrum on the bone. 
So after removal of all granulation tissue, scaling and replaning, and performing osseous surgery if needed, the flap is displaced apically. If a full thickness flap was performed, a sling suture around the tooth prevents the flap from sliding to a position more apical than desired, and the periodontal dressing can avoid its movement in a coronal direction. A partial thickness flap is sutured to the periosteum using a direct loop suture or a combination of loop and anchor suture. A dry foil is placed over the flap before covering it with a dressing to prevent the introduction of pack under the flap. In some cases, osseous reduction may be required before placing the flap apically so as to compensate for biologic width and to prevent biologic width violation. Bone removal is best achieved by use of either a taller or round, large round burr in a slow hand piece with adequate cooling using a sterile water source to prevent necrosis. And now, let us watch a short video of how apically positioned flap is done. An internally beveled incision to outline the form that we would like about a millimeter and a half apical to the existing margin. So I'm starting on the distal aspect adjacent to the tooth and directing the 15 blade in an internal fashion. So this is an internal gingivectomy. And I made a, uh, an initial incision from the distal, now one from the mesial, uh, coursing back to meet that initial incision and then work that around. And with a little bit of uh, bleeding to mark that incision, I can align them and just retrace that line. The blade now is engaging bone and sloping toward it. So I've started uh, coronal to the CEJ and worked uh, toward the bone crest with the initial incision. Once I have that outline, which has now established a more highly arced uh, position of the tissue, relatively level with the right lateral incisor, I'll make an intracellular incision and that will free that collar of tissue and expose more of the anatomic crown. Now I can remove that collar with a curette and lift it away, exposing the tooth. And now you see a more desirable form, a more desirable form of the soft tissue as well as a more desirable form of the tooth. So there's Central. A, and now with a 15 blade, I'll insert that at the line angle, this time distal, working toward the mesial with the initial portion of the internal beveled incision. And then I will work from the mesial back toward the distal using the uh, light bleeding from the margin to delineate that uh, position so I can align the mesial and distal incisions and join them. So once that initial incision is made, I'll make the intracellular incision to free the collar and then remove that with a curette. And now we have uh, relative mirror images of the two centrals and I can feel with the curette remove any little tags of two regions. So we have a good view of, of the osseous form prior to osteosurgery and we're ready to start the osteosurgery. I'll use a high-speed handpiece with fiber optics and water spray through the uh, instrument. There's a water bottle providing the water, so it's sterile water. And we're using a number eight round burr, diamond burr, to do the initial gross bone reduction. And I'll simply you know, reflect the cheek with a mouth mirror and reflect the flap with the booster elevator. So it's treating all the tissue kindly. You can see the flap elevation in the posterior region. And I'm just doing an initial gross bone reduction with a diamond burr. And it's moving it around, reducing the interproximal thickness and the marginal thickness and getting an initial uh, basic bone form without really changing the level. I'm tapering the bone toward the tooth, but I'm making certain that I don't touch the tooth with the burr. The final level change will be done with a hand instrument so that we don't damage the, uh, the tooth surface. So once again, using the... And now the surgery is finished and you can see the exposure of the complete anatomic crown form, more attractive form, with a gentle level that is even across the anterior and in harmony with the posterior levels. After discussing all the surgical techniques of crown and thinning, we now move on to combine, where surgical and non-surgical aspects are incorporated. In this technique, orthodontic therapy is done along with surgical technique. Increasing the clinical crown length by orthodontic extrusion is useful when the amount of surgical bone reduction around the affected tooth and adjacent teeth would be excessive. Its advantage, the reduced hazard to the adjacent teeth with very little change in crown to root ratio. Its disadvantage is relatively long and inexpensive treatment, is uncomfortable to the patient and surgical treatment is still necessary. It's also impossible if there are no adjacent teeth or the patient lost a lot of teeth. Orthodontic extrusion for long crown lengthening is of prime importance in the aesthetic zone because it results in a better crown root ratio and improved aesthetics than the surgical procedure alone.
is contraindicated in short root length ratio and poor root form, which result in inadequate crown to root ratio following extrusion. The extrusion can be performed in two ways, using slow orthodontic force and rapid orthodontic force. Slow orthodontic force is when the tooth can be extruded slowly, bringing all the periodontal structures with it. The periodontal structure should be lifted so that after a stectomy, enough space would be created for self-formation of gingival biological wheat and gingival sulcus. The tooth is extruded until the bone level has been carried coronal to the ideal level by the amount that will need to be removed surgically to correct the attachment violation. The tooth is stabilized in this position and then is treated with surgery to correct the bone and gingival tissue levels. Applying this method, the loss of periodontal structures of adjacent teeth could be avoided and the same bone and gingival level will be kept. The same treatment method is applied in order to reduce depth of periodontal packets in case of vertical bone loss and to increase height of alveolar bone and gingival level in the area of roots or teeth when it is unfavorable dental treatment prognosis and extraction is planned. Meanwhile, rapid orthodontic force is when the tooth is extruded rapidly. Applying the accelerated orthodontic rapid tooth eruption, the tooth is pulled from alveolar bone while marginal bone and periodontal structures do not move. During this period, a suprachrestal fibrotomy is performed quickly in an effort to prevent the tissue and bone from following the tooth. Occasionally, especially with rapid orthodontic extrusion, there is no need for osseous reduction and the soft tissue may be removed by simple excision. The tooth is then stabilized for at least 12 weeks to confirm the position of the tissue and bone, and any coronal creep can be corrected surgically. And now, let us tackle the complications of crown lengthening. There is an unsatisfactory aesthetic, especially in the interior region. This is in the form of gingival retraction because of change of marginal gingiva contour. There is a possible loss of gingival papilla that gives off the black triangles. There is now an opening of interdental spaces. The clinical tooth crown will look higher than the adjacent teeth. There is an unfavorable crown to root relationship. Resection of marginal bone leads to longer distance to the occlusal curve. And this is, there is a loss of periodontal ligament and marginal bone of adjacent teeth. In order to create continuous bone contour, it is necessary to resect marginal bone and periodontal ligament. Healing after crown lengthening The gingival margin does not stabilize early until at least 20 weeks post-surgery. This is of particular importance when in the anterior region as the aesthetics may be more crucial. After a 2-3 week post-surgery period, temporary crowns may be used until there has been full healing and the gingival margin is in a stable position. Restorative procedures must be delayed until new gingival crevice develops after periodontal surgery. In non-aesthetic areas, the site should be re-evaluated at least 6 weeks post-surgically prior to the final restorative procedures. In aesthetic areas, a longer healing period is recommended to prevent recession. Good afternoon everyone, I am Dr. Diego Montañano and I am Dr. Nini Rivas and this is Peridon Teeth, a special episode where you won't forget to brush your teeth, best. So Diego, what will our special episode be about today? We will be having our Q&A about GTR or Guided Tissue Regeneration. That's right, we will be getting questions from our viewers today via Twitter and Facebook. Just mention us on Twitter and Facebook with the hashtag Periodontit GTR. 
Oh, we have our first question. It's from at Periofan2020 and he asked, what is the meaning of GTR? Oh, I actually have a PowerPoint on that. Let's look. Before actually defining guided tissue regeneration, let us first define the word regeneration. So what is regeneration? According to the American Academy of Periodont, it is defined as a reproduction or reconstruction of a lost or injured part in such a way that the architecture and function of, of the lost or injured tissue are com completely restored. Uh, now, guided tissue regeneration is defined as a procedure that attempts regeneration through differential tissue responses. This would mean that this enables the previously periodontitis affected tooth root surface to be repopulated with cells from the PDL. Cells from the lamina propria of the gingival corium, cementum cells, and alveolar bone with the use of barrier membrane. So another question pops in mind. Why is there a need to put a barrier membrane? In 1976, a guy named Melcher suggested in a review paper that the type of cell which repopulates the root surface after the periodontal surgery determines the nature of the attachment that will form. The use of, of membranes to guide the tissue regeneration to prevent the unfavorable responses of unnecessary tissues such as uh, long junction epithelium, connective tissue adhesion, and root resorption and ankylosis. If we use a membrane, there would be a high possibilities of favorable response. There would be a new connective tissue attachment. Okay, here's our second question. It's from John Mankey Riggs from Facebook. And he asked, what are the objectives of GDR? Oh, okay. So I'll present to you my slides as well. Now that we know what GTR is, I think it's time to know now what are the objectives in doing a guided tissue regeneration in periodontal surgery. First objective is to reduce pocket depth in order to prevent further disease progression. This can be accomplished by non-surgical therapy in patients with moderate periodontitis, whereas in severe cases, particularly in the presence of interbony defects and frications, the treatment must be supplemented with periodontal surgery. Second, the periodontium must regain optimal health, function, and aesthetics as well that is acceptable and useful for the patient. Third objective is to achieve regeneration wherever it is feasible. Lastly, is also to maintain the health of the periodontium. Now that we have heard the different types of barrier membrane used in GTR, Thank you for that wonderful answer, Dr. Arivas. Oh, look at that. We have our third question. It's from at Jeremy Regeneration and he asked, What are the forms of barrier membrane that can be used in GTR? So the forms of barrier membrane include a resorbable and a non-resorbable type. So a barrier material to function properly should have the following criteria. Number one, biocompatibility to assure good tissue acceptance. Number two, should act as a barrier that excludes undesirable cell types from the secluded space adjacent to the root surface. Tissue integration that allows the tissue to grow into the material without completely penetrating it. Number three, tissue integration that allows the tissue to grow into the material without completely penetrating it. Number four, capable of creating and maintaining a space adjacent to the root surface. This allows the blood clot to form at the interface between the flap and the root surface. And lastly, number five, provides stability to the clot to maintain continuity with the root surface, thereby preventing the formation of a long junctional epithelium. So let us discuss uh, each form of membrane. So, so the first one is the resorbable. The ideal resorbable membrane should have the following characteristics while allowing GTR to take place. Number one, it should be biocompatible. Number two, physiologically biodegradable. Number three, biologically inert. Number four, breakdown products should be non-reactive. Five, it should not promote foreign body or allergic reaction. Number six, resorption rate should not vary. And lastly, number seven, resorption should be 
So, bioresorbable barrier materials for GTR have been introduced in order to avoid the second surgery necessary for removal of non-bioresorbable material. Barrier materials of collagen from different species and from different anatomic sites have been tested in animals and in humans. When a collagen membrane is implanted in the human body, it is resorbed by the enzymatic activity of macrophages and polymorphonuclear leukocytes. The downside of using a resorbable barrier membrane is that it has several complications like early degradation, epithelial downgrowth along the material, premature loss of the material. Samples of resorbable membranes are polyglycolide copolymers such as spikereal membrane, polydl lactide, lactide or ATBC, or acetyl tributyl citrate, oxidized cellulose, collagen or polylactic acid, polylactic or polyglycolic acid. So another form is a non-resorbable membrane. At the present time, EPTFE or Gore-Tex is considered the gold standard of a non-resorbable type of membrane. This material consists of a carbon to carbon bond with four attached green atoms to form a polymer. It does not result in any tissue reaction when implanted in the body. This type of membrane persists after healing and must be removed in a second operation. These are the examples of a non-resorbable membrane. Expanded polytetrafluoroethylene or EPTFE. Another one is uh, high-density PTFE or polytetrafluoroethylene. Okay, here's our fourth question. It's from Trevor Neighbors from Facebook and he asks, what are the indications and contraindications of GTR? You know what? That's a good question. Let me present again. Let's now know when do you actually use these? Indications would include intrabony defects that have two or three walled bony defects, circumferential moat defects, and if ever, aesthetic considerations may also be needed. Second is your furcation involvement. This mostly encompasses class 2 furcations and early class 3 furcations. Contraindications would actually depend on the patient's cooperation and patient's case. If the patient has poor oral hygiene, it would most likely fail. If the patient's attitude, especially its expectations and compliance, technically there would be um, some challenging procedures. The procedure is too expensive and also if the patient is a smoker, if the patient also has um, systemic problems like blood problems or diabetes. When the patient has multiple infrabony defects, class 3 furcation defects, one walled bony defects, horizontal bone loss, and a lack of soft tissue to cover the space coronally. Oh, so we have our fifth question for you, Mr. Montagnano, and it's from at Tissue Paper 99, and he asked, How do you perform a GTR? during periodontal surgery we have uh, six steps to perform this guided tissue regeneration so the first step is primary incision and full thickness flap intramuscular incision are made in preparation for a full microperiostal flap the incision should extend one to two teeth michel or distal of the area being treated to permit adequate visualization vertical incision should be placed mutually where necessary uh, remember to preserve the interdental papilla to ensure primary healing. All residual pocket uh, epithelium is then removed to permit primary intention of healing and integration between EPTFE and the flap connected tissue. So the second step is uh, preparation of bony defect. So scaling and root planing for removal of tooth deposit. Use of a high-speed rotary instrumentation for root or defect refinement. Optional use of biomechanical root surface modifiers such as CA, ETC, or EDTA and must be rinsed thoroughly to ensure complete removal. Without thorough debridement, predictable regenerative results cannot be expected. The cortification of bone for increased vascularity and scratching of the PDL to stimulate cell and vascular proliferation. Without a clot in the defect space, regeneration could not occur. 
the placing and usage of bone augmentation materials such as autogenous bone, TFDBA, BIOS, uh, and the gain or a, or a combination graft is also done in this step. Third step is membrane selection and placement. So first, uh, maintain the sterility of the material, then choose a size that offers the most ideal design for defect coverage. Shape the material with, in, with scissors and avoid leaving sharp edges. Enough material should be left to permit lateral and interproximal suturing while leaving at least 3 mm apical and lateral overextension. In cases of an EPTFE, do not remove the open microsuture or corona portion of the material. It should be trimmed only on the lateral aspect. The material should fit smoothly, avoiding folds, overlaps, and protrusions which may compromise the overlying gingival tissue. The amount of space beneath the material determines the maximum potential regeneration. Without space maintenance, regeneration is not possible. For the fourth step is suture material and suturing technique. Gore-Tex suture uh, provided with, uh, provided with EPTFT uh, membrane uh, is the recommended material for stabilizing a non-resorbable membrane and for flap closure for all membranes, while bioabsorbable sutures are recommended only for stabilizing resorbable membrane. If material approximation over the defect requires suturing, sling sutures are used and completed without engaging the flap or tissue. Uh, the material must fit tightly against the tooth surface at all points to prevent epithelial proliferation between the tooth and the material and to help in stabilizing the wound. The flap margin should ideally be 2-3 to mm coronal to the material. A tight flap opposition is desired to avoid a premature flap opening and material exposure. An apical horizontal periosteal releasing incision may enhance material coverage. Interproximal incision approximating the material are closed first. The flap is sutured with cortex or vicar sutures and left for two weeks. For the fifth step is the removal of material. Removal of the material should be four to eight weeks after the placement of the material. If the material cannot be removed with a gentle tuck, a sharp dissection is recommended. A circular incision is then made to extend one tooth initially and distally. Be careful in making the incision to prevent the damage of the new underlying granulation tissue Sharp dissection is used to reflect overlying tissue. Use small tissue forceps to remove the material. Light keratage of the inner flap surface is recommended for removal of any epithelial remnant. Do not instrument the new regenerated tissue. The flap is reapproximated over the tissue and sutured with a non-resorbable or bioabsorbable material. And for the last step is post-operative care. The patient should refrain from brushing the region for 6 weeks and use chlorhexidin for chemical pack control. Here's a video on complete procedural use of GTR in periodontal surgery. The patient presents a pure gingival recession of 4 mm, Miller first class, together with integrity of the interproximal, mesial and distal bone peaks, which are coronal to the amylocementum junction. The operation starts by making two horizontal incisions perpendicularly, therefore not beveled, about 2 mm coronally with respect to the most apical point of the gingival recession. The two horizontal incisions are joined by an intracircular incision. Two divaricated vertical incisions are made starting about 5 to 6 mm apically to the mucogingival line. Using a CTGO and rotating movements and subsequently using a Pritchard, a full thickness flap is raised for about 4 to 5 mm. The residual papillae are disepithelialized Firstly, using a 15C blade with a long external bevel.
both on the mesial and the distal aspect. Subsequently, using a 40 micron diamond burr, the disepithelialization process is completed. After having made an intracircular incision, the papillae are raised firstly with a 15C surgical blade and then with a CTGO to create space underneath the tissue and to maintain the most coronal part of the membrane in firm direct contact with the underlying bone surface. Raising the flap, the exposed root is carefully planed with curettes and rotating instruments with the aim of carrying out the etiological treatment. At this point a cylindrical burr is used with a diameter of 0.8 mm which is the same diameter as the Etican PDS2 suture. It's mounted on a low speed handpiece to create four holes in the interproximal spaces adjacent to the root. The two coronal holes must only be a couple of millimetres more coronal with respect to the point of maximum bone recession and at the same time a few millimetres apical to the amylo cementum junction. With a very small tungsten carbide burr, the cortical is perforated with small holes to expose the underlying medulla cavity. At this point, two segments of the PDS2 suture are used to create a dome above the root surface. The extremities of the two PDS2 segments are shortened and inserted within the four holes to create the desired dome effect. The resorbable membrane resolute is finished and moulded above the exposed root in order to completely cover the bone defect, extending about 3 to 4 mm beyond this vestibular defect with the aim of positioning it firmly to the bone base. Once the desired curvature has been obtained, the membrane is positioned below the previously disepithelialized and peeled papillae. It is sewn to the amylocementum junction around the tooth with a simple interrupted suture, a sling suture, using a resorbable suture of polyglycolic acid Dexon-2. The resolute membrane thus results purposely raised from the root surface to create the dome effect due to the two resorbable fragments of PDS2 suture which cross over above the root surface. The periosteum is cut into at the base of the trapezoidal flap. The periosteum is cut into at the base of the trapezoidal flap initially along the entire length of the flap and then in a more purposeful way to allow significant coronal movement. The passivity of the flap is tested by means of two surgical pincers. Only when the coronal margin is able to reach the occlusal plane of the tooth concerned is the flap judged to be sufficiently passive and fit to be sutured. The mixed thickness trapezoidal flap is sewn with EPTFE thread, once again using a sling suture. The mixed thickness trapezoidal flap is sewn with EPTFE thread, once again using a sling suture. The trapezoidal peduncle is fixed in position with periosteal stitches on the mesial and distal sides. The oblique apical coronal direction of these interrupted periosteal stitches maintains the adequate passivity of the flap. Surgical dressing is not applied to the completed suture and ice packs are also not advised in order to avoid any pressure. 
after a healing period of 12 months, complete root coverage can be seen, which completely satisfies the aesthetical needs of the patient. Comparing the clinical situation before the operation with the result obtained, it is possible to see not only the root coverage obtained, but also that the band of keratinized tissue is greater and of a better quality. Okay, here's our sixth question. It's from Gracie Churchill from Facebook, and she asks, have you experienced GTR in your surgeries? Uh, if yes, can you share with us a recent one? All right, that's a good question. Um, so here's a case report that it was done a year ago. Present slide. So here's a case report wherein they used GTR in communicating with periodontal and endodontic lesions. The case started with a patient who is a 40-year-old male with a chief complaint of pain and mobility in lower anterior teeth 10 days ago. His dental history includes the root canal treatment of 3-1, 3-2, 4-1, and 4-2 with porcelain fused to metal crown was done 5 years ago and a repeated root canal treatment 1 month ago, a crown lengthening procedure with the electrocutter 20 days ago, and a zirconia crown 10 days ago. Clinical findings included bleeding on probing, 9 to 10 millimeter pockets in 3, 1, 4, 1, and 6 to 7 millimeter pockets in 3, 2, and 4, 2, third grade mobility on 3, 1, and second grade mobility on 4, 1, 4, 2, and 3, 1. 3, 1, and 4, 1 has a class 2B defect and class 2A for 3, 2, and 4, 2. Using the classification of periapical lesions according to von Arcs after reflecting the mucoperiosteal flap. Moving on with the procedure, it started with the mucoperiosteal flap reflection and debridement via curettage, and an apicoectomy of 3 1, 3 2, and 4 2 was done. Next, they placed the bone graft in the defect, then the GTR or the resorbable membrane was placed on the bony defect then it was sutured all together and the patient was recalled after six months for surgical re-entry since there was a failure of the treatment after surgical re-entry there was a placement of a new gtr membrane then the patient was recalled after four months of surgical re-entry and here is the result and that's it for today everyone Hoping you learned a thing or two in this Q&A special. And I hope the people who asked those questions were enlightened as well with our answers. Yeah, that's right. I am Dr. Nini Rivas. And I am Dr. Jago Montañano. And this has been Periodontit signing off. And don't forget to brush your teeth. Best.